the second leading cause of death right now in our European Union uh, for under 19 year olds is death by suicide. Um, and that's our future, uh, our future Europeans. I mean, it's clear case uh, which is delivering on psychedelics based uh, therapies. Uh, it has been proven to be to be really useful. The institutions do not really have any pet friendly policies in the offices uh, in a general way. Uh, I know there are some people that sort of smuggle their pets in. Hello and very warm welcome to Erectus Health Podcast, where every week we dive into EU health policy and bring you the latest health news from Europe. As this week is European Mental Health Week, organized by mental health NGO Mental Health Europe, we decided to speak with three MEPs who more or less recently sent questions to the European Commission regarding mental health. And the questions really were right, covering mental health literacy, psychedelics, and even bringing pets to the EU institutions. So in this order, we talked with Maria Walsh from Christian Democrats, Mikolaj Pexa from the Greens, and Karen Melchior from Renew. Maria, thank you so much for having time for this podcast. And as I already mentioned, I was going through the parliamentarian questions regarding mental health, and I came across your question which focused on awareness of mental health conditions and health literacy among youth. So naturally, now I'm wondering why this question, and in other words, why do you believe mental health literacy is important? Uh, it impacts every single one of us. We all have mental health. Um, some citizens experience it uh, in in many different ways through not not experiencing it at all until a difficult period of their lives come, or experiencing it every day with different challenges that they're being faced. Um, and for me, um, given the fact that uh, I think mental health literacy needs to to grow at home in the community, at the workplace, in in the, in the healthcare system here, in the political arena too. Um, making sure people just have uh, a space to go to when they when they need it the most, um, and ultimately raise um, and end the stigma and uh, and stop the discrimination for citizens. So, uh, for me, that mental health piece is is fundamental. I'm wondering, as you're mentioning already, awareness on mental health literacy. Um, how do you see the situation at the moment in the European Union? Because uh, there are many different countries. Um, and um, um, I don't know if it's actually even easy to comment on this. Uh, but um, do you see maybe um, the weak points or uh, the things that could be fixed within the European Union? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the sad thing is, and, and to be really blunt, no member state, no country, I, I think, uh, I believe, is is fundamentally supporting their citizens' mental health in the best possible way. There is some projects and perhaps some departments doing good, um, good initiatives, um, um, but we're we're not learning from each other at a pace which i would certainly feel is beneficial to our citizens we rely very heavily and this is perhaps m m maybe more of a nationalistic view from an irish perspective we we rely heavily on volunteer groups uh, cso's and ngos to to fill the gap within mental health um, particularly around mental health literacy uh, for young and old citizens um, and that's simply not good enough you know i i fundamentally believe we need to have uh, a mental health minister uh, and department in every country across the eu including those that are in the enlargement process um, because whether you travel north south east and west um, as a citizen, so too should your rights. And with that is the mental health supports that every citizen deserves should they need the, the immediacy um, if, if, if a mental health challenge presents. Um, and, and we often, you know, I, 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 when I talk to young, young people in particular, I often say we could have the strongest currency, we could have the trade deals done and dusted, but if we don't have uh, space for our citizens to put their feet on the ground, um, step into a uh, study, a job, um, politics, um, community without having support in their mental health, then we are fundamentally at a loss. Uh, and so too is our, uh, is our European union because we are, we are simply just continuously band-aiding over, over issues. So in a long winded way, um, you know, for me, I think 
the positives of mental health, health mental health literacy and how collective work needs to happen is uh, for me literacy is given providing an individual the best possible information about their mental health, enabling a person to make informed decisions for themselves and act independently of that. But they need to have a, a benchmark to start that from. Um, and it allows someone to constantly reflect and explore options that are available to them when it comes to mental health care. And um, that for me is 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 the fundamental um, the fun, yeah, I keep saying the word fundamental, but I just to stress to those listening, that's how important I see uh, mental health supports and literacy in, in particular for, for our European Union. Aspects that you're mentioning, uh, how it could be addressed. Um, do you hope that it could be addressed or will be addressed in mental health strategy that Ursula von der Leyen promised to be presented by the Commission? actually next month. Yeah, I, you know, the, the anticipation that it would be, um, my team and I and, and multiple other MEPs are part of the Mental Health Coalition and the Alliance here in the Parliament uh, have, have really worked hard to, and lobbied um, our, our commission um, since the start of this mandate around making sure mental health was put into a strategy and, uh, and, and discussed and again, removing that um, stigma and taboo around discussing mental health and, and really making positive waves. I mean, we're at a we're at a great crossroads in many ways because we've had um, probably one of the benefits of COVID, one one of only, um, was the fact that everybody was discussing and looking for supports post COVID, during COVID and post COVID, and that also includes our commission and many of our public representatives who didn't see the importance of mental health, but then they started seeing it in their own homes and the, their themselves, and citizens were actively calling them, uh, engaging for mental health support. So now we're at a point where we have a commissioner for health and Stella Kirikiaitis, who herself is a child psychologist, uh, our first female president commission, who mentioned and discussed mental health within her within her state of the union and put in that um, point around having a citizens dialogue. Um, and they need to deliver on that. And I, I certainly, along with other colleagues across the political house, will make sure that's delivered on. We also were calling here in the parliament for an EU year dedicated to mental health uh, in this mandate. And unfortunately, that won't happen because we, uh, you know, uh, President of the Commission designated this year to be EU year skills. But that doesn't mean we we stop our work. That means we just continue on and look for uh, the remaining of 2024 or 2025 to, to do that. But ultimately, utopia for me around this strategy is building what the commission puts in next month in June for, for their um, citizens dialogue, building on that to then having an EU mental health strategy discussed and, and created with all mental health experts, uh, those in the departments as well as ministers, if they are appointed uh, and they have a brief of mental health within their, across the member states within their, within their remit that they come to the parliament and we actually roll this out for citizens because the time has come now. Uh, we can't continue to you wait for uh, another crisis or um, or ignore the fact that, you know, UNICEF and the WHO are constantly reporting that the second leading cause of death right now in our European Union uh, for under 19 year olds is death by suicide. Um, and that's our future, uh, our future Europeans, that's our future um, uh, workforce, uh, trainees, apprenticeships, academics, you, na you name it, politicians. Um, so, uh, mental health has to be at the forefront now, uh, and we, we simply don't have time. Mental health strategy is interesting for Mikolaj Beksa as well. Last year, he asked the Commission about innovative approaches to mental health. For him, innovative approaches meant certain psychedelic compounds in treating mental health disorders. This could be touched upon not only in the mental health strategy, but also in the revised pharmaceutical strategy that Commission recently proposed. But according to the MEP, there is a lot of prejudice and not everyone in the parliament are supportive or even aware about a psychedelic usage in mental health and its possible potential. People who are not aware of, uh, of the scientific data naturally uh, often act uh, with the prejudices, uh, even sometimes being suspicious about what could be uh, my motivation uh, or whatsoever. Uh, but uh, in general, after presenting the data, uh, most of the people are uh, rationally accepting them and uh, told the, told the uh, opportunity. So it's more a question of how far will we be able to spread the word uh, in order to be able to deliver uh, rather, than, rather than just like some, some, some hard, 
hard refusal. Of course, there are conservative parties which are always always trying to keep the uh, old order of the uh, world as it was uh, and keep those substances unavailable. But uh, this is not really helpful to the patients. Mikolas, according to you, regarding psychedelic research and mental health treatment, the EU is lagging behind other countries such as the US or Canada. How would you describe the current situation in the bloc? So far, what was very much neglected uh, was the uh, therapeutic use of psychedelics or uh, let's say psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, uh, because compounds like psilocybin, MDMA or ketamine are very efficient in treating uh, problems like, for example, uh, treatment resistant depression or addictions and or post traumatic syndrome. But uh, so far, it was not used because of the prejudices against the against the substances, and we would like to explore the opportunities. But there are also scientific researches that cover having pets in workplaces, and possibly benefits for the workers. And Karen Melchior is keen to share the positive results. There is scientific research that shows that uh, there is an increased um, level of staff uh, staff uh, satisfaction and lower levels of stress uh, when you have pets in the office, whether it's your own pets or other people's pets. And I think it would have a calmer atmosphere in the offices and a slightly little bit less stress uh, because it brings a sort of less formal feeling to the office if there is a pet around. Karen, the administration commissioner Johannes Hahn answered that the commission is exploring pet-related presence and will organize pilot actions where staff could come with their pets and that the legal framework needs to be built. Were you satisfied with the answer? It was not as positive as I would have liked, uh, but I think it's a work in progress. And we're looking at making a proposal to the questers in the European Parliament about allowing pets into the Parliament buildings. But I'm uh, working together with experts on what kind of project we can propose for the questers so that it's easier to set in motion and that we will get approval. As we are talking about stress levels and pets possibly helping to reduce them, how stressful the work is for you and how helpful having your dog Tilda would be? We have very long days in the parliament as everybody else does in Brussels. And it would be wonderful if I would have had the time to take uh, Tilda out for a walk in the hour that I had between my last meeting and the call with you. But I didn't have time enough to go all the way back to my flat, take her for a walk and then come back to the parliament. It would have been nice to have had an excuse for going outside and having a breath of fresh air and some fur to uh, scratch behind the ears. If you are enjoying listening to your Active's Health podcast, a friendly reminder that you can subscribe to our newsletter that comes out every Wednesday, the same weekday as our podcast. We will make sure to keep you updated with the main EU health news. And don't forget to check other your Active podcasts, such as AgriFood Brief, Tech Brief, and Beyond the Byline. You can listen to us on all your favorite podcast platforms. That is all from us today. Thank you for listening. And if you want to share something with us, we would love to hear from you. So please don't hesitate to drop us a line. Our email address is podcast at youractive.com or contact us on Twitter or LinkedIn. This episode was brought to you thanks to our multimedia team. So special thanks to them and one and only Jonas Hellebuck. Until next Wednesday, stay healthy. Stay healthy.